Evening, everyone. Uh, welcome to Atlanta History Center's virtual author talk series. My name is Claire Haley, and I'm the media communications director here at the History Center, and I'm also the coordinator of our author talk series. I'm so thrilled that all of you are joining us virtually here tonight. Tonight, we are joined by two very special guests. Author John Archibald will be discussing his new book, Shaking the Gates of Hell, A Search for Family and Truth in the Wake of the Civil Rights Revolution. And he's going to be in conversation with journalist Cynthia Tucker. Signed copies of the book are available for purchase. Um, you can get them from Acapella Books, our local independent bookstore here in Atlanta. And I'll be posting a link um, and shortly uh, that you can use to do that, or that link is available on our website. So we highly encourage you to buy the book. And if you do, to support um, our local independent bookstores here in Atlanta. They have signed copies available, so be sure to grab one before they are gone. And if you have questions for John and Cynthia throughout the program, um, you'll be able to submit those using the Q&A. Um, we will get to as many of those questions as we can. And now I'm going to briefly introduce our guest. Uh, John Archibald is a journalist for the Birmingham News, where he's been a regular columnist since 2004. He is currently a Neiman Fellow at Harvard University. In 2018, uh, John was awarded the Pulitzer Prize for Commentary for, quote, lyrical and courageous commentary that is rooted in Alabama, but has a national resonance in scrutinizing corrupt politicians, championing the rights of women, and calling out hypocrisy. He lives in Birmingham, Alabama. And he will be joined tonight in conversation with fellow journalist Cynthia Tucker. So Cynthia is also a Pulitzer Prize winning journalist. Uh, she is a syndicated columnist with her weekly column appearing in newspapers around the country, as I'm sure many of you have read. Uh, she focuses on political and cultural issues, including income inequality, social justice, and reform of the education system. She was the editorial page editor of our very own Atlanta Journal-Constitution for 17 years uh, before teaching at the University of Georgia for a couple of years. And she is currently the journalist in residence at the University of South Alabama. In addition to her Pulitzer Prize, she's received numerous awards and recognitions, far too many that I can list tonight, but just a couple. Um, she was uh, recognized by the National Association of Black Journalists as a Hall of Fame member the Colby College's Elijah Paris Lovejoy Journalism Award, um, the David Nian Award for Political Journalism presented by the Shorenstein Center at Harvard University's Kennedy School of Government, and the Alabama Humanities Award um, given by the Alabama Humanities Foundation, just to name a few. There's so much more I could say about these two amazing journalists tonight, but I know you want to hear from them. So I will now turn it over to Cynthia and John to begin the conversation. And thank you both for being here tonight and to all of our audience members, thank you for joining us. I wanna say welcome as well. Uh, thank you for being here. I am thrilled to be here with John to talk about his new book, his delightful and poignant new book. John, why don't you start us off with an excerpt? Okay, we'll just uh, start at the beginning. <laughs> I was born in the midst of revolution, the son of a preacher, the grandson of preachers, the great grandson of preachers too. They were all Methodists until you look beyond the civil war. They preached on horseback and on foot. And in my dad's case, in a little white Fiat spider, they preached of right and wrong and grace and goodness and believed it, I think, to their bones. They preached of stewardship, pay up in Methodist speak and dutifully pass the collection plate for missions in faraway places and building funds at home. In the name of God and something they call sanctifying grace, they preached in the old South and longed for a new South, but were silent, too silent, on the complicit and conspiratorial South I never came to see until I was fully grown. I was born in Alabaster, Alabama, then a little crossroads outside Birmingham with a Methodist church and a Baptist church and a set of railroad road tracks that gave it reason to be. I was born on April 5th, 1963, in the blissful and willful ignorance of the white South. I never knew until much later that as my mother went into labor, the foot soldiers of revolution gathered across the county line, that at, that at the moment of my birth, Birmingham readied for a battle that was long overdue. The Reverend Dr. Martin Luther King Jr. had not yet put his dream to words but he had come to this town to change the world with another masterpiece. Birmingham, white Birmingham, didn't like King's arrival, 
not the merchants who mourned the lost dollar or the cops who demanded obedience, not the Klansmen who longed for the way things used to be or the preachers who feared the noise and glare and shining incongruities who wanted so badly to stuff the powder back in its keg that they never saw the explosion coming, even as they lit its fuse. I was born in the midst of revolution and I didn't even know. A week after my birth, eight clergy members, Christians and Jews, printed a letter in the Birmingham News asking for the demonstrations to stop in the name of law and order and common sense. Eight white Birmingham men of God stood for the status quo. King read their words and understood exactly what they meant. It was the past coming for the present, a call to do nothing again, to slow the role of justice in the name of peace. It was, it was cowardice masquerading as reason, silence in the guise of God. Martin Luther King Jr. read that letter and decided he would march in Birmingham. Even his friends advised against it. He was too important, they said. Tensions were too high. Birmingham was too hot. They warned him he could be hurt or killed or kept in jail for months by Eugene Bull Connors Police Department. But he marched and was arrested a few days, a few hours later. It was Good Friday, the day Jesus was hung to die after being betrayed by silver and silence. It was April 12th. I was seven days old. King was charged with parading without a permit, a crime deemed serious enough for solitary confinement. They put him in one cell and his colleague, Reverend Ralph David Abernathy in another. And there they stayed for days. Connor, an active Methodist, thought Birmingham could keep, keep King silent. Connor wanted him silent because silence is safe and law-abiding and powerless. Silence doesn't march or demonstrate or demand justice or force you to see yourself. Silence vanishes into the night like those men in hoods in their 57 Chevys with whip antennas bent double. But what came out of that cell spoke louder than King ever had up to then. What came out changed the city and the world and screamed with a voice that would not be silenced. Legend has it King began his letter from a Birmingham jail, what many think of as the most powerful written document of the civil rights era on the margins of newspaper scraps. It was the best recycling ever. He finished the rest in a notebook. Somebody slipped him inside and the pieces were assembled like a jigsaw puzzle by friends by King's friend, Wyatt T. Walker. The words were loud and strong and righteous. I never read them. Not in Birmingham schools in the 1970s or my dad's churches or in history classes at the University of Alabama in the 1980s. They were not assigned or recommended in classes I took. I never read them until I got my first newspaper job at the Birmingham News in 1986 and needed to know the story of the city's past. The date of the letter was never lost on me. It was April 16th, 1963. It was 11 days after my birth, 23 miles from the hospital where I was born. I came to love that letter for it was bold and spoken phrases I could pretend to claim in the way a white person of privilege might foolishly, foolishly want to do. I am in Birmingham because injustice is here. Yeah. I cannot sit idly by in Atlanta and not be concerned about what happens in Birmingham. Injustice anywhere is a threat to justice everywhere. Can I get an amen? We are caught in an inescapable network of mutuality tied in a single garment of destiny. Whatever affects one directly affects all indirectly. We are, it does. I wanted it to be mine. I tried to claim it. It was my town, the time of my life, but it would take a long time to find my place in it and not the way I thought because the point of the letter did not emanate from the lyrical phrases that would become memes for justice. The point of the letter was, in many ways, the rebuke for retreat in the name of peace, for obedience in the name of the law, for silence with the voice of God. The point of the letter was shame and disappointment and a truth so deep and ingrained that some people look at it a lifetime and never see it at all. The point of this letter was not a message to black people who lived the struggle and knew the barriers and blockades. It was to cautious and careful white people like those eight clergy members, the waitful eight some called them, to, to whom King addressed the letter, like members of my family who thought they understood. It was to people just like mine who tried to live like Jesus, but turned the other cheek 
to look away. Wow, <laughs> powerful stuff. The role of silence is a narrative thread throughout the book and it speaks loudly. What started you on this journey uh, to think about your father's sermons during the civil rights movement? What started you on this journey to read all of his sermons and to figure out what stance he had taken or not taken? Yeah, uh, well, well, first, you know, my father, I have nothing but love and great admiration for my father, who is the most principled and decent and uh, honorable human being I ever met. So one of my great regrets is that I never asked him when he was alive what he was saying during the civil rights movement, because I expected that he said what he said at home and, and how he acted. And when he died in 2013, little to my knowledge at the time, uh, among the things that were moved into my basement uh, by all my siblings, and uh, with there were a couple of file cabinets that contained uh, every sermon he'd given from the 1950s to the early 2000s. And I never really thought about them. I hadn't really listened to them as a child, I admit. <laughs> and, uh, but at, at some point, I started to wonder um, in the, the date of the letter and you know the fact that I was born at that time in this place had always kind of eaten at me. Um, but I went down to look and I started by looking at the date of the Children's Crusade in Birmingham and thousands of children were being arrested and put in jail uh, and marching with Dr. King. And ironically, it was Children's Sunday at the church where my dad was preaching in, in Alabaster uh, the week after that. So as children in Birmingham were in jail, dad preached a sermon on Children's Sunday that, that in the print, printed version anyway, made no mention of that. It talked uh, of, uh, of, of, um, of the trust and how we need to, to, to have the trust of children and, and which was a nice sermon in a vacuum, but it wasn't a vacuum. And so I, it was kind of startling to me to say in one of the most critical times in our history, in the cradle, as we like to think of it, I know a lot of us like to think of our towns as cradles of the civil rights movement, but we sure claim it too. In the cradle of the civil rights movement, we, we were talking about danger, I mean, about troubles in faraway places and not right outside the stained glass window. So I said, I have to look farther, look more. So I grew up in a, very small Baptist church in a very small town in Alabama. And the black preachers I knew all had jobs on the side because the churches were too small and too poor to support them full time. So I have to tell you, I was good and grown before it occurred to me that being a minister is a job like any other job. And you have to please the customers and you have to please your boss. Um, that must have played a role in your father's thinking about how far he could go, don't you think? That is certainly what I'm told. In the Methodist church, things work a little bit differently in that, in that you are essentially an employee of the conference. And uh, as it's designed, you... Uh, it, you, there, the ministers are itinerant in that they move every few years to a different church. And, but the reality of that is that it, you move up the ladder if you do everything that's expected and don't make waves and don't cause trouble and aren't, um, uh, in, in those days, put on a list uh, that the conservative Methodist layman's union created that said essentially we're not taking these pastors so a lot of the when i talked to preachers of that generation as to why why this conspiracy of silence existed which is exactly what it was and is in some cases today um they would all say well you know if if you you know if you preach about um the race question as they called it then which i, I 
again, I have trouble with that phrase, but I digress. Um, if you preach about the race question today, this Sunday, you'll be looking for a new church the next Sunday. And many who, and I talked to many who were kept in small churches their entire career because they did dare to speak out. And, um, and it was universally said, do you know why your dad did this? It's because he was looking after you, you know, he was, he was making sure you had a nice home and a place to live. And, and, and all of this as, as, uh, as a way to make me feel better, which it did not do because, uh, because that made me feel part of it, made me feel complicit in it, which I was. And, um, and so that's the reason it's a, and, and again, we talk about it. It's a, it's a perfectly rational reason. If you want to find an excuse for not saying the things that need to be said to a, to a flock that comes to you for guidance. And again, I love my dad and, and more, more than I can ever possibly explain. Um, but, uh, but uh, it, it was, it, you know, it's very disappointing. And as Dr. King said in that letter, you know, you can't have great disappointment without great love. And I've never felt that phrase more powerfully than I felt it when I was reading those sermons. So your father had four children, a wife who did not work outside the home, so she could not have supported the family. Is it reasonable to expect um, that he would have uh, been more vocal. You cited some ministers in the book who were more vocal. They paid a price. Um, there was a Birmingham attorney. I believe he was an attorney you cited. He paid a price. Is it reasonable to expect that people, and not just your dad, um, ordinary folks who have to make a living, is it reasonable to expect that we would um, put our jobs at risk, paychecks at risk to say and do the right thing. Well, I mean, that's, that's, the, that's the torture of my entire uh, process in writing this because, you know, on the one hand, you want to say, I'm holding my dad accountable. I've got to hold my dad accountable. On the other hand, you're saying, uh, you know, am I being too hard on him? And, <clears throat> and when I talk, I talk to preachers about it and they, and they talk about those who made the sacrifice and it's hard for me to look at that as a, sac a sacrifice, as such, as such a sacrifice. And I know, you're, I know that's a good question. I know that any of us put in that situation would ask ourselves that. Um, but when I think of sacrifice, I think of John Lewis getting his head beat in mm. on the Edmunds Pettus Bridge. And I think of Fred Shuttlesworth getting bombed out of his house and beaten as, it, as he tried to, uh, at schools in Birmingham. And, and, the, and what we consider sacrifice I mean, it's, you know, it's, it's, it's not about our comfort. It's about um, standing up for what's right and facing those consequences. And that's a hard thing to do. Um, but at the same time, you know, I think that as much as anything, I don't think it was fear so much of those things that created the silence, not just with my father, but many others. But uh, I think it was a, a loyalty to the church which was telling them to not talk about the race issue. And I think it's more likely that he was a company man because he loved and believed in the church to his bones. And, uh, and like you said, you know, it was, you, it, you were an adult before you understood that preaching was a job. And I'm exactly the same way because every preacher I ever met growing up was a righteous I mean, every method, they were, they were righteous people who I thought, and I thought everybody was like that. And, you know, and what they said privately, I thought they said from the pulpit. And, and I never really thought about what they said from the pulpit because I wasn't listening anyway. But um, <laughs> I, I just, uh, there are a lot of reasons. And again, not again, um, I, I think, I think when, you know, a lot of people look at this as a book about my dad, but I don't look at it that way. I look at it um, as a book that uses my dad as a vehicle to talk more about us. And uh, while we can't go back in time and say, hey, dad, why are you doing this? And how would I do this? If I were standing in a pulpit in 1960 in Birmingham, Alabama, what would I be bold enough to say? We don't know. 
So on that subject, uh, we have an excellent question uh, from a member of the audience. Um, what if you had had your column in Birmingham in the 1960s? Oh, I, you... I, I fear. I fear that I would have been a company man too. Um, and, and, uh, but I think it important not to condemn those who were there and I don't, and this book is not about condemnation. It is about looking at what the people you most admire um, uh, did, where they failed and where they did not uh, at whatever point in time we're talking about and, and using that to help us make decisions about how we're going to, to act today when similar or comparable issues come up. And, um, and for me, that, it doesn't tell me that I would write hard columns in 1960, but it sure makes me want to write them today. And, um, and, and that's, that's all we can do is use the pulpits we have in the ways that we think are best, the best uses now and in the future. You know, um... The culture of the South has changed so much in my lifetime that is, it's easy enough to forget what things used to be like. There is a wonderful story you tell about your mother and her experience inviting some Black friends of hers to church. Would you talk about that? Well, the way I understand it, it was... I don't believe they were friends of hers. I think that it was that time in history when a lot of black college students were going into white churches um, in, in the fifties to, um, to see what would happen to integrate the churches to, to, uh, to in their form of protest. And, and at this time, my, my dad, my grandfather was uh, at Decatur first Methodist church in Georgia, I believe it was. And, um, and some people came to that church. And the way it was told to me by my mom is that um, they came to the church and she welcomed them in. And her father seated them. And uh, he was moved from that church suddenly, uh, very shortly afterward. And um, she always blamed herself, and blamed herself for that. Um, because I think her mother felt like he was moved from a, 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 a nice, good, prominent church, uh, a good appointment, as the Methodists would call it. And, um, and she blamed herself for a long time for that until she became older and realized that she shouldn't be feeling blame. blame. She should be feeling pride about that. And she felt pride in both herself and her father about that, who she loved dearly and I was never fortunate enough to have met because he died before I was born. So you were a bit of a knucklehead mm -hmm. as a kid. Uh, some and some a would say that hasn't changed. <laughs> um, so you never considered uh, going into the family business, becoming a minister yourself? Um, I mean, no, not seriously. There was there was one moment at, once I had after I had started my professional career, I uh, I thought about it for a minute um, and realized very very quickly that was a terrible idea because I a I did develop my vocabulary in a newsroom and uh, you know what that can do to you and yes, I have no filter. Yes, I do. And um, and I have a tendency to say things that are on my mind and um, and I probably would have done. Uh, vastly more harm than I could have done good. And um, there are moments I have great, uh, there are lots and lots of moments when I have great amounts of doubt as to many, many things involving religion and a, a sincere skepticism of, of, of organized religion. So um, I would not be the guy any uh, flock would want to come to for any kind of spiritual guidance. And I think my dad understood that. <laughs> <laughs> you have another excerpt, I think, that you're going to share with us this evening. I, I do. The, 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 the first part of the book deals largely with race. And, the, and not to separate it 
two separately because I think the things are woven together. But this deals a little bit with uh, some of the issues facing the Methodist Church now, which is which is um, the issue, LGBTQ issues in gay marriage. And uh, so I will uh, I will get started on that right away. All right. This is from later in the book. I come back to the letter always like that idiot preacher dad talked about who pulled out his Bible and chose his passages at random until he found one that told him what he wanted to hear. I come back to the letter and it's as though my finger whirls around and around and down to a paragraph that says those things I want to say with the power I don't possess, with the surety I don't know, with the scope and depth that comes with the timeless voice of a king. I circle and I point and it works at least as well as the Bible. In deep disappointment, I have wept over the laxity of the church, this is King, but be assured that my tears have been tears of love. There can be no de deep disappointment where there's not deep love. Yes, I love the church. How could I do otherwise? I'm, the rather I'm in the rather unique position of being the son, the grandson, the great-grandson of preachers. Yes, I see the church as the body of Christ, but oh, how we have blemished and scarred that body through social neglect and through fear of being nonconformists. Yes, Dr. King, I weep as well. Oh, I know by now I cannot take your letter and apply it as I like for all the wrongs and ills and injustices I see in the world. I cannot take it as a white man and use it like civil disobedience for dummies or as only a work of literature for meaning greater than its original, with meaning greater than its original focus. It is not appropriate to appropriate. I get it, but I do wanna learn for it from it. For we really are, now as then, as always, caught in an inescapable network of mutuality, tied in a single garment of destiny. My church, again, looks to exclude and makes, this, and, and, makes and cites laws to justify drawing lines between us. And though I have faith in my father and pride in his evolution, his words were always, will always ring more hollow because the right ones were hardest for him to say from his pulpit in times when they were needed the most. It is a disappointment so deep it must be love for family, for the church, for beliefs I held and expectations built over a lifetime, but for broader disappointments too, for echoes of George Wallace that ring in the words of Donald Trump and others in their condemnation of immigrants and Muslims and the poor and more, for mobs not just in the American South, but across the nation and the world that cheer politicians and preachers whose lips drip with hatred who build walls to divide, who point out distinctions between people for political and fi or financial or cultural gain. I spoke to George Wallace before he died and he claimed he regret regretted some of the words he used, some of the lines he drew. Now I hear the worst of him parroted across the globe, not just in the South, but in Wisconsin and California and Europe and Australia and New Zealand and the Middle East and Africa. The Wallace strategies are employed anywhere that fear of people who don't look or talk or love or worship like the locals can be tapped to build an audience or a political base. It is anywhere the cries of anger and fear and defiance overwhelm those who hear the voices of our better angels, but are too afraid or uncertain or unsteady or outnumbered to speak them to the world. I have a friend and colleague, Kyle Whitmire, who claims all that is evidence of the Alabamification of America, where a common enemy is more important than the common good. I believe he thinks too small. It is the Alabamification of the earth, the politics of fear, the religion of judgment, the strategy of us versus them. Give the people someone to hate and they will love you for it. My father was a good man. I love him, but being good is not all it takes. We are remembered rightly or wrongly by what we say and do but we are defined just as much by what we don't say, what we lack the courage or will to speak out loud. I wish dad had been more vocal about race in the 60s. I wish he'd been more specific about prejudice and judgment throughout his life in the pulpit, more specific to be more specific about the things he clearly believed. Sometimes a parable is not enough. Sometimes the world requires a rhetorical baseball bat. I am forgiving of dad. At least he saw all as his neighbors and helped them as he could. I am less forgiving of the church, the lax, hesitant, halting church that damns the sinner and damns itself with its own fear and social neglect. Then as now the church plays it safe and counts its coins and builds a tax exempt dynasty, dynasty on the body of Christ and the judgment of a mob. 
the Methodist church, my church, disappoints me most because that love is the deepest and because it claimed to be better and more open in the hearts and minds and doors. The United Methodist Church in 2019 with global influence and support from the heartland emphasized that open minds and hearts don't really apply to all gay people, don't, don't really apply at all to gay people who are tolerated in the denomination's flowery langu language of acceptance but shunned where it matters in its official position that continues to proclaim the practice of homosexuality is incompatible with Christian teaching. It was part of the steady tightening of church discipline since 1972, since that first general conference after the merger that was supposed to show just how open the Methodists were. Delegates in February of, 20, 000, of 2019 voted not only to keep the condemning language in the discipline, the book that sets out the church laws, but the United Methodist churches would have to certify adherence to it and would be punished if they go astray. Under those changes, churches like those reconciling congregations my, congregations my brother belongs to could be stripped of the United Methodist brand if they fail to comply. Any preachers who dare conduct the same sex ceremony could be punished with a year long unpaid suspension, do it again and they could be expelled from the ministry. A church judicial council later declared part of the punitive policies unconstitutional in a legalistic document better fit for a court of law than a declaration of spiritual faith, but the message was sent again. Oh, the church is quick to say gay people have worth and encourages members not to reject gay friends or family, but demands no church money be spent on any gay groups or for the purpose of promoting the acceptance of homosexuality. The language is an awful lot like it was in the 50s and 60s when well-heeled and influential Methodists in Birmingham gathered to form the Methodist Layman's Union to fight the incompatible notion of desegregation. We are not here to attack anyone, Circuit Judge Whit Wyndham said in 1959, as he pushed for a church that would be all white and free to resist any integration efforts. We wish only that the integrationists would leave us alone so we could keep our mouths shut. He and others harnessed the power of fear some 1,800 people gathered for that meeting, but only one person really spoke out. It was Thomas Reeves, a white student who dared participate in the sit-ins, who was mentioned in, in a, that Harrison Salisbury story about hatred and courage in Birmingham. Reeves stood to call bullshit. He pointed to the group's booklet of principles, which, among other things, warned against the mongrelizing of the races. We must not allow this document to become the basic idea that the Methodist church is strictly Anglo-Saxon, Reeves said. One young man with a voice. Reeves was dragged away from the podium after a chant of take him out. Open hearts, open minds, open doors to throw somebody out. Even then, Thomas Reeves spoke with his tiny pulpit in the place he lived. In that time he was there, in that moment, it didn't seem to do a lick of good. The MLU was formed and passed resolutions that, among other things, demanded that no church money be spent on any group that pushed for integration or for the purpose of promoting the acceptance of integration. Sound familiar? Reeves thought he was a voice crying in the wilderness. He was a troublemaker, the loudmouth, the thorn in the side of reputable, important people. And yet his word, words meant everything, everything. Of 1,800 people gathered at that Birmingham church, his words were the only ones worth remembering. The MLU went on to fight it ineffectively against integration that was, of course, inevitable. The group was on the wrong side of history and Reeves was right all along, no matter the consequences or what happened around him, because to do nothing, to say nothing, is to condone what happens around you, which ensures that nothing changes. As King wrote in 1963, for human progress never rolls in on wheels of, inevitab in, of inevitability. It comes through the tireless efforts of men willing to be co-workers with God and without this hard work, time itself becomes an ally of the forces of social stagnation. We must use time creatively in the knowledge that the time is always ripe to do right. Not just about race, but right, whatever that right may be. In the days after the United Methodist Church vote to strengthen bans on same-sex marriage and gay clergy in 2009, I wrote a column under the headline, Methodist, don't let the door hit you on my way out. I was done, over it. The church had closed its heart and its mind, I wrote, so I wasn't gonna stick around for the rest of the show. I don't wanna wait, 
I don't, I, I won't wait for it to shut its doors. I finished. Thank you. I'll let myself out. Murray, that's my gay brother, by the way, my brother who happens to be gay, um, wrote in the Camp Rehoboth newspaper that he did not plan such an exit from his church. He would stay because that is his way, but he acknowledged his disappointment. Grief hit me all over again, he wrote, having just lost his husband and partner of 35 years. Epworth Church has been my spiritual home for more years than I can count, and both Steve and I found friends who welcomed us, a community that shared our values and like-minded spirits of similar beliefs. How could it not be clear to any rational person that we all deserve the right to join in worship, no matter our sexual orientation? Our color or nationality or income level or professional status or gender or anything else. How could it not be clear, we ask now? Thomas Reeves wondered the same thing in 1959. Dad preached a sermon later in, late in his career called Like the Face of an Angel. In it, he wrote of an encounter he had in Decatur in 1972. It was one of the last sermons I read in his files from a lifetime behind the pulpit. Alabama was smoldering over issues of race in 72. Wallace was on the presidential campaign trail for the third straight election until he was shot by Arthur Brimmer in Maryland and left to spend the rest of his life in a wheelchair. School desegregation, despite all the court battles, was just coming to some Alabama cities and was still a new indicator. Income inequality was outrageous and still is, and the Klan still marched occasionally in North Alabama. The 60s were gone in the rest of the world, but everything came five years late, at least to the great state of Alabama. So tensions were high. So tensions were high as Dad sat in his office at First United Methodist Church, preparing a sermon that had nothing to do with any of that tension, except in parable. The phone rang in the office, and Dad picked it up to hear a member of the church named Paul, who was anxious and upset, who said he needed to see Dad right away. Of course, Dad said. Of course, come on right over. The guy was there in a matter of minutes. Decatur's not a big town. He was a tall man, usually ramrod straight, as Dad put it, but he stooped in the doorframe, worried and fidgeting. What is it, Dad asked, worried now. Paul just shook his head. I know there's nothing you can do, he said, but I need somebody I can talk to. And then it all came out in a rush. Paul was a businessman. He owned a store in Decatur and tried to do right by his customers and his workers too, he said. He tried to know what was right in the world and used his conscience to guide him when it seemed like he needed a guide. It was nothing, he thought, when he hired a black person at his store for the first time. It wasn't exactly progressive. It was 1972, after all, but his employees didn't see it that way. They were so upset, he told Dad, that all but one of his white workers quit the store on the spot just because he hired a black person. Paul felt betrayed. He had shut the store down at least until he could hire and train more workers. He was frustrated, disappointed with people he thought he knew, fed up with the irrationality of a divisive world. But the more he talked about it, the straighter he got, Dad said. The more he hurt himself, the better he felt. As Paul unfolded his story, Dad said, the desperation gradually drained from his voice and the smile returned from his face. And he said, but Bob, I did what is right. I can live with myself. And I thought, what a way to live. What a way to live. Your brother, Murray, came out to his parents, if I recall this correctly, in the late 1970s. And your parents embraced him. That was pretty, that was early. I Especially believe it was early in the deep south. It was early to mid 1970s for sure. 74, 75, I believe. And, uh, um, very early. Yes. Very early. And your parents embraced him mm -hmm. when he brought Steve, who became his life partner, later his husband, to visit for the first time. Your father insisted they come to church. Mm hmm. Your mother was always introducing when all of her grown children coupled off. Uh, she would introduce Murray and Steve at church along with everyone else. Given what I know about homophobia among church folk, black and white in the South, 
that strikes me as pretty remarkable. It is remarkable. I mean, the, 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 every bit of it is remarkable. And, um, uh, and I have considered him a brother-in-law for, since that time. And, you know, that was remarkable for me for a little jock uh, kid from Alabama playing football in, on one side and, 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 and enjoying this very unusual relationship otherwise. And it, it's been the most valuable thing in my life to have that experience, to be honest with you. And, um, and, and I marvel at it. Uh, but, you know, it's also, it's very, it's very similar to me in terms of, you know, in, in the whole uh, discussion of race as well. I mean, my dad was also instrumental in, in, in desegregating a scout troop, for instance, and making sure that black ministers were brought into community conversations about the church and all these and these things. So his, his love for people was so strong and demonstrated on many levels. But in, in, in both cases, and, and this is just a thing about voice, not action. These are two different things. Um, but it was also, it was difficult to talk about from the pulpit as well, because the Methodist Church was opposed to the, uh, was officially against, uh, 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 against re recognizing those relationships. And so what we saw at home didn't always jive with what we heard from the pulpit as well. And the silence was again, in some cases, uh, deafening until uh, until he grew to a point where he could um, express those things more. And I think that there's some similarity in that. And but it's also and that one of the mo the proudest moments that that I have um, in the book is when he was. Uh, and this is a story passed down from my mother that um, that at one of the the general conferences, which is a larger regional conference of the church um, in a discussion of, 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 of this issue that he was able to stand up and talk about it there um, was one of the great moments of pride for me because he, he found a way to, to, to use his pulpit in, in that way uh, in a very difficult issue and it had a lot of blowback on him. And, uh, and so uh, it's not, you know, we, we can all look back at those moments when we didn't have a voice or we didn't say the things we felt like we needed to say. And Lord knows we all have them. I know I have them. There are stories about them in there. And, um, and I have many, many more, you know, and, and, and you know how it is when you write, when you, when you give your opinion off and certainly we've given the yes. wrong ones <laughs> and, uh, and there. And so uh, I'm very conscious of the, all of those things. And as I, as I, as I write and assess the man I most admire in the world, I can't help but look at myself and, and say, um, who are you to be able to say this? But I hope that we're all able to say, who am I? Uh, and what are we gonna say next? We have um, a question that's a great segue uh, from a member of the audience. She says, John, you and I share similar life stories, though her lineage is Baptist. Um, she is like you on the tail end of the baby boom generation. And her question is, does our generation remain fearful because we had so few role models? Are we reflections of our parents' complicity? We seem to champion the younger generation's tenacity, but struggle with finding it in ourselves. Wow. I love the uh, wording of that question. I, I think it's, it stands alone on it. I, I think that, you know, I feel a lot of guilt about maybe, I feel like I should be Catholic because I've got Catholic guilt. <laughs> I mean, you know, it's just about everything. It's ridiculous. But um, I feel like our generation has failed in a lot of ways. I feel like um, part of that uh, is, you know, I, in 1972 and when, when Decatur schools were integrated uh, late, um, and, and my dad insisted I go to integrated schools then uh, and, and schools were, and I went to integrated schools that were largely 50 50 in, 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 you know in Alabama integrate you know diversity means black and white largely and certainly did then. Um, and I went to integrated schools that whole time but five years after I leave integrated schools they shut it down because it's gone all black and we've resegregated ourselves mm -hmm. more quickly than we desegregated ourselves mm -hmm. in the first place Indeed. and um and so I think that uh in a lot of ways we've 
we've seen progress and, and, and the value of being around people who are different from ourselves is so great. And I think it's often underestimated by people that the, the people who went through that era who, who are go through that experience now, I think have a different experience and a different outlook on life than other people do, who see people as other all the time. And I, and I think that we have progressed in that. I think that people have stopped being ashamed of being racist in large degree in the, you know, in around, uh, you know, certainly not just in the South these days, but, and we have come to learn in recent years that the things that haunted the South for so long are not unique to the South in any way, shape or form, that the language of George Wallace is repeated, uh, not just around the country, but around the world as we just, I just wrote and I just read. And um, so I think that, um, you know, we can go on and on about, uh, about this. Uh, you know, I always thought of the 60s as this time that was long gone, that the language and the rhetoric and, and, the, and the struggle that people went through then was something that we, that brought us to another place. And, and I think it did. I just feel like now more than in my entire lifetime, I have a sense that I can feel what it was like. Mm. It's not a pleasant feeling because it indicates that, that my entire lifetime has been sort of a standstill. And it's I'm babbling on, but we've made a lot of progress and we haven't made a lot of progress. If that answers the question in any way. So this is a question from Wayne Richardson, whom I think you know. I do. Um, he says, um, as you know, I knew and respected Bob and you. I wonder how the zeitgeist has changed over the years and how Bob would have viewed the world through the present time lens were he able to do so? Um, I have a sense that he would be marching for Black Lives Matter at this point. <laughs> um, I really do. I mean, I think that uh, and really the older and more secure he got, the more he was able to um, verbalize those things. But, but at the same time, again, you know, he, he was quiet. He would quietly do things his, his whole life. Um, that were good and important things. Um, but I think that uh, I think that he would see the importance of, of using his voice. And there's a, there's a bit in the in the in the book that I talk about. It's the last conversation I had with my dad before he was before he died. He was in hospice and I had just uh, I had written something uh, uh, that was uh, somewhat controversial about race, I believe. And and um, no, you had <laughs> written something controversial, John. Well, <laughs> we do what we do, and um, but he, re you know, he could barely talk at all. I mean, he was lying in bed, a shell of himself, um, with, with tubes all in him, and he reached out and grabbed me by the hand and said, "You know, I'm glad for you. I'm, I'm proud of you for taking on the issues of race." Which, again, I didn't think much about because, you know, all I. It's, it didn't say, I mean, it's just a thing. We write things for a living, you know, and it's not courageous of us to decide that we're going to say what we think or what we think is right. It is what we do. And it doesn't, it doesn't um, require, I mean, we don't have to get permission from the Pope or the Bishop or, uh, or we don't have to make sure there are butts in the seats uh, when the collection plate passes. Uh, so, um, uh, you know, I, uh, I forget where I'm going with that, but, um, uh, I fully understand you, Wayne. Uh, uh I, but I think my dad would be, uh, be much, he would embrace, uh, many of the, uh, progressive changes. Um, and he would love to see, um, he would love to see people get justice who have not had justice before. Um, another question um, that relates to uh, Black Lives Matter. Uh, how do you feel white clergy in the South are doing today with Black Lives Matter? Are there parallels with clergy during the days of Martin Luther King? 
I think there are parallels and, you know, it varies widely from denomination to denomination and church to church and pulpit to pulpit, uh, I feel like. But, um, you know, uh, last year after after George Floyd and after this um, racial reckoning, as we like to call it, there were so many great signs of hope. I mean, and, and you know, you know, uh, 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 Mountain Brook, Alabama, very completely white, richest city in Alabama, suburb of Birmingham. And it still startles me to think of of pictures of seeing after George Floyd's uh, death, a thousand white people in the richest uh, enclave in Alabama kneeling at the uh, on the lawn of the elementary school, which is mind blowing in some ways. Whether that manifests itself in any real way remains to be seen. And it appears that thanks to pressure and thanks to uh, political speech and thanks to other things that progress in some ways in churches and beyond. I mean, cause let's face it, this is not just a church issue. It's a boardroom issue and it's a cultural issue and all these things. It does seem like it has rolled back and I don't know exactly how lasting it is or if there will be, um, uh, you know, if that rubber band will pop back uh, or has already, um, but there, uh, there are signs of progress. Uh, but churches, by and large, um, have disappointed me in that regard. Uh, I think that most of the churches that stand up and speak out um, and stand for justice, uh, and that's certainly true in the Methodist church, where I come from, I mean, at large, at large, um, often says the right things but in ways that don't actually um, do the things that need to be done. Have you been surprised? I, I, will, I will admit that though I probably should not have been, I was a bit surprised by the widespread embrace of Trump uh, by so many conservative Christians, especially in the South, uh, but around the country. Did that surprise you? Um, mm -hmm. Given his, he doesn't seem a particularly religious man, um, given his history, has that surprised you? Uh, I, I didn't know you had that gift for understatement. Quite as well as you <laughs> but um, yeah, it surprised me. I mean, how do you hold up a Bible and talk about two Corinthians? And yes, not, indeed. I mean, and, I mean, it's, uh, it's, it's, it's clear on his face that uh, he has no concern or knowledge or care for anything that um, this, this Jesus said. Um, and yet Christians leap to him, uh, not well, uh, well, evangelicals leap to him in a way that is uh, mystifying. I mean, and the only uh, re uh, rationale for them are disturbing. I mean, it's uh, you know, it's about power, money, race, um, and, and 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 it's not about anything that was said on the Sermon of the Mount. That's for sure. And um, and so I find it I find it disingenuous and disheartening and dangerous. And uh, and I was surprised. And I mean, Trump doesn't bother me at all. Um, it's the uh, sheer number of people who. Uh, are willing to accept that as a moral way to live. Um, as the son of a minister, grandson of ministers on both sides, great grandson going back for generations, the church has been in your family. You have left the church. Murray stayed, but you have left the church. Is, is this, um, a problem for the church writ large, do you think, um, that it, it seems unable to move forward into the 21st century um, to embrace what I believe is the teaching of Jesus Christ? Is this going to be a problem for the church? Well, clearly it is. I, the numbers are pretty staggering right now. I mean, if you, if you look at the people who identify themselves as nuns, N-O-N-E, none, people who claim no religious affiliation it's in the I believe in the 40 percent in the 40s I mean it's 
well, I better not quote a number because I may get that wrong, but it's essentially um, the same as the people who identify themselves as evangelical Christians, which we consider to be an extremely powerful political base, right? And if the number of people who claim no religion is equal to that of the number of people who claim evangelical religion, that's a significant number. And that number of nuns continues to rise uh, all the time. And, um, and, and we can, there's debate about why that is. I personally think much of it is, um, I mean, I believe it has to have something to do with a belief that hypocrisy has taken over. And that, as I put it in the, in the book, I guess, that, uh, that my fear and my, 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 my worry that, that, that this is less about spirituality than it is, you know, uh, ladder climbing at Jesus LLC. <laughs> and, um, you know, I think that uh, it, hypocrisy drives people away because people are not stupid. Um, you, and, um, and so I do think that's a grave concern for the church. It's also, but more importantly, it's a grave wake up call because I think, and the Methodist church has lost tons of membership over the course of time. Mm. And whether, and if that's, you know, they, they worry that they need to keep people in the seats by not, by not offending them with um, these dangerous thoughts about inclusion. Um, I would argue that it needs to stand for something if it wants to keep people of good heart in the church, um, but they don't. <laughs> pretty sure they don't listen to me. Well, uh, again, we have a, a question that is a great segue. This question is for both of us, but I'm going to very courageously throw it to you first, John. <laughs> <laughs> it says you both have vast experience in writing columns expressing opinions. Is our world too divided today for these opinion pieces to really change minds rather than confirm existing opinions of readers? Well, you're, you're, you're confirming my gravest fears <laughs> because yes, I feel like the world in which both Cynthia and I grew up writing columns is a different world than we have today in which, um, in which uh, quite a lot of people uh, who, sh who uh, write opinion under the name of opinion or perhaps not under the name of opinion and social media of course has created even more and we have entire news networks that exist with opinion only and I feel very very strongly I always felt very strongly about columns that the, the, the best ones uh, are more are based on good reporting and good mm. information mm -hmm. um, and 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 uh, than anything that is simply an opinion. And I will always believe that. I do feel like we have less resonance and less, val less value than we used to. And that we, um, we do end up uh, writing to people, preaching to the choir, as it were. I agree with everything John said. And I guess I would throw um, another wrinkle in it. Since I teach uh, a few classes, I'm a part-time instructor at the University of South Alabama. Um, and it is both interesting and depressing <laughs> to understand how little uh, young people know about news. I spend a lot of time in my classes on two things, teaching them the difference between a news story and an opinion column, because they've grown up with Fox and MSNBC and they don't seem to know the difference, the other thing, uh, given the last presidential administration, I have to spend a lot of time on is teaching them how you discern a fact. There is such a thing as a fact. And rather than, certainly with my class, I'm not trying to teach them, um, give them my opinions. I'm just trying to teach them to discern what a fact is and to teach them that people can come, have different opinions about how we should respond to those facts. But for heaven's sakes, we all ought to have the same facts. Um, and one last question for the two of us. Uh, we're both sub Southerners, we're both Alabamians. Um, although John, I have to say, this is a bit distressing. Um, is the about the same age as my brother, who's the youngest of my mother's four children. I'm the oldest. My brother, also named John, John Kevin, 
is the youngest. He's about John's age. Uh, and my brother also these days sports a gray beard, John. <laughs> I'm always telling him, please, if you're going to keep your beard gray, stop telling people you're younger than me. <laughs> um, so um, a member of the audience wants to know, as journalists who have covered the South for so long, uh, what gives you hope? I'll go first because I think uh, they should hear from the guest of honor last. Um, well, there are some signs of hope in the South. For me, um, in the last election, Georgia was a great sign of hope. Honestly, I, I never thought um, Georgia would pull off sending uh, its first Black senator to the U.S. Senate, Senate and its first Jewish senator to the U.S. Senate. And they often campaigned together. That gave me great hope. A couple of years ago here in Alabama, I got hope uh, from the election of Doug Jones to the US Senate. Unfortunately, that didn't last long. We now have Tommy Tuberville, who's a whole nother story. Uh, but I do think that here and there, there are signs of hope. John? Uh, yeah, I think that's I think that's true, and, and I think the South is changing, and I and I and I do think that there there is less distinction between the South and the rest of the country. But you know, mm -hmm. I look at places like Birmingham. I mean, because I'm from Birmingham, and you know, and and I say, I say this in the book. It's one of my favorite lines. Uh, sorry, but uh, you know, in the 1950s, uh, uh, Birmingham and Atlanta were essentially the same size, and and as I like to put it, Atlanta declared that it was a city too busy to hate and Birmingham wasn't that busy, right? So, um, and, and we see what's happened since. But to look at Birmingham today uh, as compared to the Birmingham of my youth, um, it's a remarkable, it's, it's sort of, to me, it's an oasis uh, and, and, and sort of a sea of, of, of something else. And, um, you know, I think that there are people across, and, and, and it's, not just, it's not just about politics. It, 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 there, there are great people everywhere if you're willing to go out and talk to them. Uh, almost any time you go out and look somebody in the eye and talk to them in real life when we're able to do that, um, my soul is restored by that um, just because we tend to label them we tend to assume what they believe. If they're on social media, I mean, with one comment about any issue, we have them labeled and pegged and, and, and moved left or right. But the hope is in going out and, and being able to talk to people again and to just uh, treat them like people. And, and that's, I mean, I, I mean, it sounds hokey and all that, but, but every time I get too overwhelmed with politics, I do that and just go talk to people and, um, and I find that things are better than we think they are. And, um, and so I hope we can do that more often. Uh, John, I have really enjoyed this conversation. I have too. Um, I really enjoyed the book. I loved reading it. It was delightful and moving and powerful um, and um, I've enjoyed the questions from the audience. I urge everybody who's heard John, please go out and buy a book. Claire? Well, thank you so much, Cynthia, and you, John. Thank you so much for being here tonight. It was such a delightful conversation. I know that I got a lot out of it, and I know that our audience did too. So I know we're all missing that point that and John really stuck with me. We're all missing that human connection right now, but I love that we have, you know, this technology and these means to still be able to, to get together in some way and have these important conversations. So thank you for that. Can I say one more thing? One yeah, quick course. thing. And that is um, that this is just so important to me because I am a huge fanboy of Cynthia Tucker. <laughs> And I have my whole career, I've looked at what she's done and it, it is so important and she does it with such grace and with such wisdom. And she's such a great writer that I can't believe I'm here. And I know I don't want to gush, 
but I really appreciate you being here. It means a lot. Well, thank you. Right back at you, John. You know, I read your columns faithfully. My mother was the person who first turned me on to you. I, I hope she's listening tonight. I believe she is. Uh, and I think I told you, she already has your book. <laughs> well, thank you. Thank you. Thank her. Well, if you don't already have your book, I highly encourage you to get it. Um, I've posted the link a few times in the chat uh, to local independent bookstore, Acapella Books. Um, so you can get a signed copy actually from there um, of John's book. So I hope that you're all able to get it and read it and enjoy it. So if you enjoyed tonight's conversation, we have lots more in store um, for the Atlanta History Center Author Talk series. Um, next week, we're going to be welcoming James Carroll, and he will be discussing his book, The Truth at the Heart of the Lie, How the Catholic Church Lost Its Soul, and that is a memoir uh, that he wrote. And he will be in conversation with uh, GPB's Virginia Prescott, so that'll be a lovely conversation. And if, it's, you know, if tonight's conversation about religion is interesting to you, I think you'll enjoy uh, next week's as well. Um, you can find a full lineup of author talks at atlantahistorycenter.com. They're all virtual. They are free. Um, so we hope that you'll be able to join us in the future. And if you want to revisit any part of tonight's conversation, uh, by the end of the week, a recording will be posted to Atlanta History Center's YouTube channel. So if you want to share it with friends um, or revisit something that John and Cynthia discussed tonight, you'll be able to do so. So once again, to everyone out in the audience, thank you so much for being here tonight. We're so appreciative of your participation, your great questions. We weren't able to get to them all, unfortunately, but they were wonderful. And again, Cynthia, thank you. And John, thank you so much. And I hope thank everyone you. has a wonderful night.